based on the book of Job, chapter 15, verse 20 through 35, we are given the theme of this off the wall melodrama at 11 p.m. Written, directed, and starring Richard Maurice. 11 p.m. is an objectively strange film. This film is a smorgasbord of inconsistency from the performances, the story, and the visuals. But as Christ is my savior, this film is so intriguing to watch and we can learn the lesson of the life of a wicked man and actually be impressed with some other things. The plot is as such. Lewis Perry, played by Sammy Fields, is a writer and an athlete with a chapter due by 11 p.m., hence the film's title. He's writing a melodrama about humans becoming animals or something like that, and his rival, uh, Roy Stewart, played by A. Marion Williams, wants him to participate in the fight at 11 p.m. Perry's girlfriend, played by Orrin Johnson, and her mother, played by none other than Orrin Johnson, wants him to go to a party at... p.m. Perry seems to be calmly overwhelmed or unbothered by these conflicting tete tots as he falls asleep with his dog in his lap. Now Perry begins to dream a dream about a street musician named Some Daisy played by Richard Maurice who takes in Roy Stewart played by H. Marion Williams who is dying. Before Roy dies he asks Some Daisy to care for his son Clyde and ensures he does not fall into a life of crime. His wallet has enough money to pay for the boy's education. Roy dies, and out of the nowhere, someone steals the wallet before Sundaysy can get the wallet. It really didn't matter though, for Sundaysy seemed to be doing well and had no problem paying for Clyde's education. Later in the film, after he saves a young woman named June, played by Orrin Johnson, he also takes her in, marrying her when it becomes clear she has nowhere else to go because of the man act. Despite the promise Sundaysy was to keep, he could not stop Clyde from running the streets. As a result, he sends Clyde to a boarding school, which is actually a front for a criminal gang. Sundaysy, continuing to fail at keeping his promise to Roy, never bothers to check in on the kid, and Clyde is raised by crooks and grows up to become an even more shrewd criminal. The grown-up Clyde, played by the one and only H. Marion Williams, decides to scam money out of Sundaysy. Clyde not only robs his unqualified foster father, but he also seduces June away from him and smuggles her to be a cabaret dancer. Son Daisy is heartbroken, but carries on for the sake of his daughter Hope, who is played by Maurice's daughter, Wanda Maurice. Many years pass, and Hope grows up, now played by Orrin Johnson. Look, I know, I know, they can only afford very few actors for this flick. Anyway, while Clyde was driving, he spots her. But he fails to recognize her and prepares a little scheme to steal her from his cabaret business by hook or by crook. However, she is dating Louise Perry, the same actor as our writer, narrator, dreamer of dreams if you recall, and prevents Clyde from abducting Hope after catching everyone's fade in Clyde's gang. Sun Daisy is enraged and wants to kill Clyde but has a heart attack instead. But before he dies, he vows that he will come back for Clyde. After Sun Daisy's death, Hope decides to dance in Clyde's club after Clyde convinces his madame to persuade her to dance in her club. Perry catches word and sees his girl at the cabaret. He gets annoyed, then gets mugged, and then gets amnesia. Sun Daisy begins to hunt Clyde, even taking over a dog's body and biting Clyde, causing him to give up on his advances towards Hope and the family. The long dream ends at this, and Perry wakes up and with all his friends waiting for him. He explained that he dreamed the last chapter of his book which is how the movie ends. This movie does not lack originality, to say the least. The plot is original and creative. However, the story is erratic and deranged. The problem with 11 p.m. is that the sequence of events sometimes doesn't matter, and the characters can become very inconsistent. For example, there is a scene in which Little Hope constantly feared Clyde Stewart, sensing that he was evil and the same man that took his mother away. However, when she gets older, she doesn't even remember him. And then later on, after building up all this development, why Hope fears and doesn't trust Clyde, she dances for his club with relatively little to no convincing. No one's motivation is apparent besides Clyde, the wicked man. 
even though Son Daisy's character was a movie star, it was hard for me to sympathize with him because he was probably one of the worst and most incompetent fathers in cinema history as he didn't check on Clyde at the scam boarding school once within 12 years. 12 years. One checkup would have probably foiled the whole scam. The acting in this film is hit or miss. However, I might have to give them the benefit of the doubt since many of the actors had to play multiple characters. Nonetheless, I will be as objective as possible and critique the acting. Sammy Fields gave an alright performance. Orion Johnson was, in some cases, alluring. However, she never quite glories and can easily forget about her as time passes. Richard Maurice does what great directors who star in their own films do. They try to become the face of the whole movie. It wasn't as bad, but he could have easily toned it down a little. H. Marion Williams had the best performance out of all the actors bar none. No matter what character he played, he got into the soul and mind of a hardy criminal from rise to fall. Though I've talked about this film's flaw, let me repeat this. This movie is very entertaining to watch. This movie is never dull, Richard Marie does show an elegance for the dramatic shots and has a very few nice composition in his film. He indeed shows his imagination through the cinematography and editing. And when you remember that the majority of the plot takes place in the dream, certainly you can be convinced that yes, this is something that will take place in the dream, especially with the use of surrealism by turning the doll into Maurice's head to symbolize the dreadful ringing that is overcoming Clyde Stewart. Even more impressive was that Richard Maurice was a rookie filmmaker at this time with little training and was entirely self-taught. You can't help but ask yourself, what if? Because Maurice showed his creativity with such a low budget. If he had remained a filmmaker, who knows what he might have accomplished with a little bit more training, experience, and budget. All in all, this film has replay value indeed despite its flaws. Considering the challenges that so-called black filmmakers face, the fact that this film was made at all is pretty impressive. That said, I hope this intrigues y'all to watch this film for yourselves. Till next time, peace.